thank you very much for having me here, and thank you for putting me in the last panel. <laughs> I'm actually happy about it because um, my presentation draws uh, on a lot of aspects that have been highlighted before in the previous presentations. Um, today what I'm going to present is um, an integrative theoretical model, so it's more work in progress. It's, it's, yeah, it's a bit of a think piece. Uh, and I hope that it can be the basis for further di discussion, maybe tomorrow. So um, my, my main dependent variable, what I'm concerned with, is the electoral success of populist political actors. Um, and not because that is per se important, but because it's a very clear manifestation of the problems we are dealing with. It's very manifest, it's there. If you look around the world, you see a lot of people that you could consider uh, populist political actors and that have been um, to various degrees um, successful in elections. It's all over the world, uh, in every continent, um, you have representatives of those. So what do these people have in common? I mean, we already talked about that. Um, what makes them populist? Um, I think what makes them populist is that they share a populist political ideology. Unfortunately, I cannot go into detail here because that would require a presentation of its own, but we can say that they focus on anti-elitism, um, on exclusion of others, um, uh, they are in favor of the people, um, and they are in favor of popular sovereignty. Um, but if you are interested in that, we can go back to that in the Q&A maybe. What I want to present today is an integrative causal analysis dealing with the question, how can we explain the success of populists? And um, why do we need an integrative causal analysis? I have the feeling so far um, that sometimes um, we behave a bit like, like those um, men, those blindfold men from the common trope, you probably know it, with the elephant, you know? <coughs> Populism is the elephant and some scholars are like touching the trunk and some the legs and they say, oh yeah, populism is a style, populism is a strategy, yeah? and actually it's just populism, it's an elephant. And we need a more holistic approach. And that is the reason why I try to provide an integrative analysis across different levels of analysis following like Coleman's boat, macro, micro level, um, both together. And also across social sectors, culture, politics, economy, media, all together. Um, uh, Rensman argued for that in a, in a very interesting piece recently. And of course, related to that, across scientific disciplines, sociology, political science, psychology, communication. We all have to work together to explain populism. Otherwise, it won't work. So what I want to present now is a bit of a mapping of all the possible uh, antecedents on macro level. And I'm focusing here on stuff that is pretty much underpinned, has been underpinned by empirical evidence. So what are the cultural antecedents um, of populism on macro level? One very important one is authoritarianism. Um, authoritarianism is pretty much related to populism. I mean, there is disagreement what authoritarianism is, but it's mainly based on the three dimensions, conformity, authority, and outgroup. And there is something like an authoritarianist culture um, in some countries that is more pronounced than in others. Um, and on the other hand, you have uh, libertarianism. And authoritarians, they perceive libertarianism as a threat. Um, and you can you can see that that is not stable over time. Actually, a lot of scholars say that the cleavage between the two is increasing. Um, yeah, some people have called that uh, a silent counter-revolution or cultural backlash. Maybe Pippa Norris will talk about that later um, in, her, in her presentation. So we have like an increasing cleavage between those two. Um, and then we have economy um, economic, economic <coughs> antecedents. Um, mainly named is there a crisis and in instability. Um, but it doesn't matter if that is like an absolute crisis. It's important that it's a perceived crisis. You know? 
I mean, even, even if you're based in Switzerland, like I was, and there's no actually economic crisis, if people have the feeling that it could affect them, then it's an important factor. Um, and yeah, we come to, to that later a bit. And then also we have political antecedents, and I just want to reiterate again the majoritarian systems. Um, I'm a big fan of Leipzig, and he said that, that majoritarian systems are a bit less kind, a bit <laughs> less gentle in their discourse, and that can foster populism. Um, there's an interesting study by Dunn, and, and they show that, that there is a relation between majoritarian systems and uh, social tolerance as well. And yeah, in particular, there's presidentialism, um, the perils of presidentialism, um, populism is easy, for populism it's easier to to yeah to thrive in, in presidential systems and then we have the media and yeah I don't want to talk about that so much because you're all very familiar with that um, we have um, mediatization which is actually an increasing increasing pervasiveness of media logic in society we have also populism by the media if the media actively um, act as populists so these are all antecedents on micro level. And then we have also antecedents on micro level. And they relate to some micro level phenomena, but not all of them. We have cultural antecedents, and that is authoritarianism on micro level. Um, I think Stana did a really good job when she said that you can, you can um, operationalize authoritarianism on micro level with child rearing values. You know, the way you rear your child um, shows a lot about how authoritarianist you are. And then you have the idea of declinism. If you have the feeling that your country is in decline or the world is in decline, that may foster populism as well. Um, and the same applies to the perception of cultural threats, like immigrants, liberals, libertarians. Um, then we have economic antecedents, and we talked about that a lot today. And I think what, what I really want to stress here is that not only relative deprivation is uh, an influence, a predictor of populist attitudes, but also relative gratification. There is a great uh, piece by Jerna et al. in PLOS One, and, and they show that there's actually a V-curve between the two. And um, even people that feel that they are better off than others tend to be anti-immigrant because they have the fear of loss. Um, and sometimes that is called the fear of falling. You know, the, you have the, f the fear that you fall um, uh, economically, and and I think that's an important part. I was based in Switzerland, as I said before, uh, and people are pretty well off there. But what they really experience in our time is a fear of loss. You know, they they are afraid of their privileges, and I think that's an important part. And then we have political antecedents. There is political distrust. Um, and I think what is important with political distrust, and you see that in the data, is that it's not an overall effect. Because if you are a libertarianist, and you have political distrust, that doesn't mean that you turn to populists. But if you are authoritarian, and you have the feeling that the authorities are questionable, then you may turn to populists. You know? so, it may actually be an interaction effect, and that is the reason why the empirical evidence is so ambiguous. <coughs> and then we have media antecedents, um, mainly media distrust here. So um, I just go very briefly um, to uh, the role of the media in here. Media basically, uh, they um, offer a forum for populist political actors for various reasons. Um, what you can see is that there are correlates between media level variables and other antecedents of macro levels. In our data, we see that there is um, a relation between authoritarianist culture on macro level measured by World Value Survey um, uh, variables and populism in the press. And the same applies to majoritarian systems of populism. So you actually can show that on macro level. Um, and what else um, do the media do? Um, and I think there has been a lot of research recently here, and we can, yeah, we can pretty much say that, that the media can foster authoritarianism. They can cultivate it um, uh, by, yeah, 
uh, either if it's TV or if it's political ads. Um, <coughs> um, and it also increases po uh, populist attitudes. And by increasing that, um, it can also lead to attitudinal uh, polarization. And very important, media are um, like the, yeah, they, they are the, the channel for the perception of threats, which is really important. So what do the media do in the end? They increase polarization by th two means. First, because all these effects are, in general, they are sub-level, uh, sub-group effects. So they affect only one segment of society, and that segment changes, and the other one does not, or changes in the opposite direction. So that is polarization <coughs> already. But there are also studies, um, and one I was involved with, that really shows that populist um, political, uh, me populist messages in the media they actually increase the polarization. Um, yeah, so I gave you a, a brief overview of these um, factors, and what I now try to present you very briefly is I try to integrate all these factors into one model. And that's, I don't know if that is a good idea, because normally I tell my students, if you have models, theoretical models, keep them simple. And that is what you now see is totally the opposite. Um, <laughs> But I think it's worth a try. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so I think I think this is this is like all these factors that I presented before integrated in one model. And of course, we don't have the time um, to go into that. But it's basically um, it's basically like like Coleman's boat. You have the macro level here and the micro level there. You have like the different um, sectors of society, like media, politics, economy, and culture. And you have all these interactions and all these paths in here. Um, below there are the uh, psychological predispositions. They are like clustered together. Um, yeah, if you are interested in that, we can go back to that uh, in the Q&A. I cannot explain that in detail. But I think what is really important is that we have those models because that helps us to see where we already have empirical evidence, where are gaps of research, where, where there's something missing. You know? Just to give you a brief impression, I, I populated that model with like, empirical studies. Um, and you see that there's some parts where we have like, pretty solid evidence, and there are other parts where we don't have any, any evidence at all. Um, and I think it's really important to collect that um, and to see what we have to do uh, in the future. And just um, to finish, I, I just want to outline some, some avenues of research um, uh, resulting from that model. And the first one is we have to look for additional variables because, of course, that model isn't comprehensive yet. And then there are some missing parts. So I would invite you to come to me and say, like, ah, oh, yeah, Sven, there you missed something. You know? There's this variable, and I found that in my research. Um, yeah, there are different possibilities like um, uh, anomie um, on, on, on micro level or the more consequences of populism, negative ones, positive ones. Um, the meso level is, is, is totally neglected in the model um, and that could be entered but that would make it even more complex. Um, then we have interaction effects, I already talked about that and, and that is really important, how do the macro level factors and the micro level factors interact. Um, as I said, um, are maybe only the authoritarians um, affected by political distrust, um, which means that that would lead to, to political, uh, to populist attitudes. Or what about the relation between economic <coughs> prosperity and the fear of falling? Um, the role of the media um, is also still neglected. I mean, Frank presented um, a lot of research today, and I, I think he and um, my colleagues from Zurich, they are trying to narrow that gap, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, uh, and you all um, already contributed to, to that today, so I think we have to update that, that model already. Um, and in the end, it's also important to validate that internationally, and I don't mean the US and Europe so much, because that's where we are from. I mean, we're already here. But as you could see in the beginning, there are also populist actors in other parts of the world. 
and maybe we should like include them uh, in our models um, to prevent this from naive particularism and stuff like that. So I'm already over time, sorry. Um, uh, thank you very much for your patience, and I'm looking forward to your input. <laughs>